should I rise or should I fall? Even so, Lord, your mercy is an even flow. Hello, good morning once again. Welcome to Whisk Green Hope Daily Sabbath School Lesson Study. Here we have with us today, Elder Ronald Thomas. He's all alone today. Uh, due to some unforeseen circumstances, he's all by himself. So, but I know he can handle it. Good morning, Mr. Thomas, Elder Thomas. Happy New Year to you and Happy New Year to all those who haven't been following us so far for the week. We pray that God will bless you and your family exceedingly abundantly, more than you can ever ask for, imagine, or even think about. Pray that this year will be the most successful year you have had in your life. Well, good morning to you and thanks for those blessings. I, I will certainly accept them as blessings. <laughs> and a happy new year to, to all. I, I really hope that this year, more than ever, that we might find peace, peace, real peace in Christ, and we might have health, physical health, as well as spiritual health. That's my wish for everybody who, especially those who are expecting to see the return of Christ, and even those who are not looking yet, I wish that they would find Jesus this year. Absolutely, absolutely. So, Elder Thomas, we're going to move right into our lesson for this week. We are looking at Jesus is our high priest this morning, and we are still in the book of Hebrews. But I'm going to ask you to bring to us our memory text for this week before we move into our lesson. All right, so our memory text comes from Hebrews 8 and verse 1, and in the lesson studies from the New King James Version. It reads, this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Let us reverently bow our heads for prayer. Almighty God and our Father, we just want to thank you for your loving kindness towards us in that you have permitted us to enter into a new year. We pray, O Lord, that we will not just see it as a new year, for new financial and academic pursuit, but we'll see it as a year that will become drawn closer to you. We pray that you will be with these studies that we are conducting every morning. We pray that those who listen may be enlightened and those who have not yet clicked that link, who has been seeing the link and not touch it, we pray, oh Lord, that somehow your spirit may move upon their hearts to seek and to inquire into what the link is all about. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So at the time as we are studying a powerful lesson, there's more to this lesson than meets the eye when you look at the topic. And we're looking at Jesus, our high priest, this morning. So after going through the lesson, I came up with the first question. It says, Today's lesson states, and it's in the opening paragraph, that Hebrews 5 to 7 introduces a second function of Jesus. He is our high priest. What is the first function? So we see that earlier in the week, we would have looked at first function of the priest as a mediator, the one who would actually go between God and man, who would negotiate as it is a relationship between God and man. In Leviticus, as we would see in some of the texts that we have in, in today's study, Leviticus chapter 1, we would see where the priests were ordained to bring sacrifices and to present gifts on behalf of the people. And so we see that that would have been the first work of the priest to be a mediator between God and man. So is his role as king a function? Yes, his role as king is also a function. And as we would see, Wade speaks about the order of Melchizedek, where he was also 
And today's lesson speaks about the second function, and it speaks about Melchizedek. We know that Melchizedek was also king, and he was a priest. And so we see Jesus fulfilling these roles as the Davidic king who would represent us in terms of warfare, in terms of battle against the forces of evil. He's a king. And he leads, as it were, his people, or he fights for his people. And that's one of the roles. So we see Jesus fulfilling quite a few roles. As was explained to, to David, what would happen in his line of kings that would come from him, from his generation. And we see another function of Jesus is to be a king. And so... We know that in the Old Testament times, we recognize that the high priests or priests were only priests and kings operated differently. But here we see Jesus functioning as both priest and king. In what ways do the function as high priest fulfills the promise of the Davidic king? When we... When we go back to the book of Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 7, and where David was told what would happen in terms of who would come after him. And there we would have seen some of the requirements or what would happen there with David as king and who would come after him. From verse 5, I'll pick it up from verse 5. And Nathan speaking, and he says, Go and tell my servant David, thus said the Lord, Thou shalt build me a house for me to dwell in, whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in the tabernacles. In all places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel, speak I a word with any of the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build ye not me an house of cedar? And we know that David was intending to, to build a house for God. So we'll jump down to verse 10 that says, Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, and they will dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house. And when thy days be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build me a house for my name and will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before me. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. And we know that this initially was speaking to the reign of Solomon. But in, in Solomon, we see some of the things here that God always expected to do for his people Israel. And one of them was to establish a kingdom that would last forever, a king that would reign forever. And we see Jesus himself now coming to fulfill that role as that king who would rule Israel forever and his priesthood also being somebody who would be uh, relating with God on behalf of his fellow men we see Jesus operating in this role and it's a role that is an everlasting role okay we have a few texts to go read now you'll take the first one Leviticus 1, 1 to 9. I will take Leviticus 10, 8 to 11, and then we'll continue with the others as we go. Leviticus 1, 1 to 9. And the Lord called 
unto Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, ye shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd and of the flock. If his offering be a burnt offering, be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. And he shall kill the bullock before the Lord, and the priest Aaron's sons shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood around about upon the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it in pieces. And the sons of Aaron, the priests, shall put fire on the, upon the altar and lay the wood in order upon the fire. And the priests, Aaron's sons, shall lay the parts, the head and the fat, in order upon the wood that, it, that is on the fire, which is upon the altar. But his inwards and his legs shall he wash in water. And the priest shall burn all on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the law. That's verse 9. I will go to Leviticus chapter 10, verse 8 to 11. It says, And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee. When ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. And that ye may put difference between holy and unholy, and between unclean and clean. Verse 11 says, and that he may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord had spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. For the priest's lips shall keep knowledge, and they shall seek the law at his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Numbers chapter 6 verses 22 to 26. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and unto his sons, saying, On this wise ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And then our final text is Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 to 4. Hebrews 5, 1 to 4, it reads, For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way? For that he himself also is compassed with infirmities, and by reason hereof he ought as for the people, so also for himself, to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honor upon himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. What was the function that the priest was fulfilling here, Elder Thomas? So we, we see quite a few things mentioned there as the functions that the priests were to carry out. Uh, one of the things that we recognize is that the people were not able to go to God for themselves. And so somebody was ordained, which is a priest was ordained, to go to God on behalf of the persons who were basically from Israel, but today it would be on behalf of anyone who was seeking after God. And the other thing we, we recognize is that the priests were also 
to teach the people. So the priest was supposed to be knowledgeable in the word of God, in the law. And he was also to be a teacher to, to the people. So there are quite a few functions. Also, we recognize that the priest had the charge to bless the people. God had given the priest that charge to bless the people. And so those were some of the functions that the priest had. I just want to go back to your text in Hebrews, make reference to it. Um, seeing that Paul was suggesting that there were other functions that he may have had to carry out. All right. So um, he mentioned that um, in, in things pertaining to God, that, that this was a function of the priest. Anything pertaining to, to the relationship to um, how we should relate to God, anything pertaining to um, the statutes, the principles that God would have had. Um, the priest was the one who was like a, a go-between and he had to, and I, I guess that would have come in, the, in terms of educating because he had to educate the people of what the requirements of God were and how they were supposed to live he would have been that person who would make sure that the people knew what was required of them. And he would also act somewhat as, as a judge in certain cases uh, where the people are concerned, where anything has, that has to do with God was concerned. So yes, we saw that also in in Hebrews, he had to offer, he was one that would have to offer and sacrifices on their behalf. And those sacrifices we knew were, were animal sacrifices representing the death, uh, the Lamb of God that would come and die for the sins of the people because without the shedding of blood, we understand that there would be no remission of sins. So a function of the priest then here was to offer sacrifices that he had to do continually. And in this case, the earthly priests had to also offer sacrifices for themselves because they were not perfect. You mentioned it there, so I just don't want it to slip this morning. I think that's the salient point of our study today. I'm going to hold you responsible if we don't get it out. It says in verse 3, and by reason there hereof, he ought as for the people so also for himself to offer for sins. That's the, the part I don't want to leave out. Um, to offer sacrifices for sins. So now we want to emphasize that because we're looking at Jesus, our high priest. Yes. And you quite clearly laid the distinction what a, early high, a high priest could do and that he even had to offer for himself, sacrifice for sins. But Jesus is our high priest. What's so different between Jesus, the high priest, and the earthly high priest? And secondly, there are some organizations that still have priestly roles. Why is that role where people go to confess and ask for forgiveness from earthly priests is no longer relevant? So if you thought you were going to get away from me this morning, Brother Thomas, that would never happen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So one of the things that we see is that the difference with Jesus is that um, he being the one who came in the form of man, God in, in man's flesh, to be the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. He was sinless. He was found sinless. And so because he was sinless, he had that privilege right to represent us before God. And as according to our text again, we are reminded that it was of after the order of Melchizedek, meaning that it would last forever. His priesthood would last forever. He would not die, as the lesson would state, and the Hebrews would state that so because he lives forever and he ministers in the heaven of heavens, 
then that's the diff- that's one of the differences. The priest, he is sinless, so he, he never had to offer sacrifice for himself. He only had to offer sacrifice for the sins of men. And because he lives forever, there's no change of his priestly ministry. He ministers forever. Now, it's an interesting question that you ask about priesthood today and, and what goes on with that. One of the things we recognize is that we also are called to be priests. The Bible says that we have a royal hey, We are coming to that. We are coming to that. <laughs> I, just, I want to stick with that question. I know you want to get an escape route there. So <laughs> I'm just asking you about why, if Jesus is a priest that lives forever, and he never sinned. And he, I accept all that you said this morning, and that he lives forever to make intercession for us who are sinners. And why is it now that Jesus has come into the picture? Okay, let me structure it another way. Now that Jesus has come into the picture as our high priest, as the lesser state this morning, is it still relevant to have earthly priests where I can go to and make confessions, Father, I have sinned today. I've lost it at someone who was passing out. Oh, I took something from the job that I shouldn't have taken. Or oh, I libeled a person who I work with. I coveted someone. Um, I murdered someone. Should I? Um, do I still have to do that to an earthly priest? No, certainly not. Because those functions belong to Christ. In fact, it wasn't even that that was a ministry. The folks who had to, to come and bring a lamb in the days when the sanctuary was on earth operating, they would confess their sins, putting their hands on the head of the lamb. I don't know that they were confessing their sins even to the priests, but they confessed their sins as uh, transfigured upon the lamb that was supposed to take their sins. So today, the lamb of God that takes all sins upon himself is Christ. So there's no earthly, there's no need to confess sins to any earthly priest. And so that particular function, of course, is not relevant anymore. There's no earthly priest who has that authority to forgive sins. The only sin that we can forgive is, the only thing that we can forgive is if somebody has done you wrong and they come and they say that you're sorry and you have that privilege of forgiving them. But for somebody to come and confess um, their sins that they have done in their personal lives against whomever else, there's no reason to come to any earthly person because if when that happens, it simply means that that person is taking upon themselves the place of Christ. And that ought not to be. Elder, could you read for me First Peter 2.9? 1 Peter 2 and verse 9, it reads, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And see that, well, now you have it because you, I see you were rushing to get there. You wanted to get ahead of me. I had my questions all structured out. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, uh, what is this all about? A royal priest with a holy nation. Who is that? And what does it all mean? All right, so, so let's, let's look at the text and see what we can pull from the text itself as we go into it. It says, ye are a chosen generation, and ye are a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. And what is it about these people, and how do these people, how do these people really represent God, it says that you should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So those who have accepted Christ and are living according to the precepts and principles of, of God are showing 
or are giving God praise, as it were, by the way in which they live. And in so doing, they become a part of what is considered to be a holy nation, a royal priesthood. In that role, what they're doing, what we're doing, we're being witnesses of God's grace, of God's salvation. And because we're witnesses of God's salvation, we actually are mediators, as it were, between God and those who have not been saved so that they can see, they can have an example as to how we should live in connection with God in response to God's laws. We are teachers of that also and principles of the word of God. We live by them. We are seen as a people who now are acting as it were in some of the functions of the priests that we looked at earlier, because they were teachers, they were knowledgeable about the law of God and the word of God. And so they were teachers. And also we now are able to, we have the privilege of helping others to come to know Jesus Christ by presenting to them the word of God and also praying for them. So we have that role to pray for others, to pray for their salvation. And sometimes people find themselves in difficulties and challenges and so forth. They might feel as if they have no connection with God. And we are to bring them before God. Uh, friends, families, we have that privilege of bringing them before God. So in those ways, we would be acting uh, a particular, that particular role as priests. So we are being called to minister, as it were, and, and sometimes uh, stand in the gap, as one song say, I'm standing in the gap for you. We are called at times to stand in the gap for others. But our ministry is not straight to God. We have a high priest. So our ministry is through Jesus Christ. But we play a part in that role as God's chosen people, or who would have chosen to accept Jesus Christ. What difference it should make in our lives that we are indeed a royal priesthood and how should this truth impact our lives? And I think that that is a very valid question because at times we, we live as if we live unto ourselves and we think that we, our salvation, our Christian walk is all about us and God, and it has nothing to do with anyone else. And sometimes we act as if we don't even care about others, and that is not a, a, a right way for us to live. So um, the difference that it should make when we recognize that we are not just citizens of heaven, but we are also part of a priesthood, then it certainly says that we have a responsibility to point others to Christ. That's a responsibility that we have. It's not something that we could, could omit or something that we could get away from. So there's no point in time that we should think to ourselves that, hey, I'm not concerned about them because they're on their way to hell. I'm on my way to heaven. If they don't want to accept Jesus, well, that's their business. Um, I'm just on my merry way. No, we have that responsibility when we see people, and especially if the spirit of Christ lives in us, we would have that kind of compassion that we do with desire to see people getting saved. And without them even asking, we should then go to God on their behalf. So when we recognize the, the, the role that we have to play or, or the responsibility that we have as Christians, I think it would mean that we would now live differently because we recognize that we're not just living to ourselves, but we are witnesses and we have the responsibility of pointing others to Christ. Our final question tonight is, what is your takeaway? When we look at the top lesson today, Jesus, our high priest, what is your takeaway from the lesson today? My takeaway is that I can be confident 
and I can come boldly to the throne of grace because Jesus, being a high priest in heaven, not only is he uh, representing me in heaven, but he is alive forever. Not only that he's alive forever and he's representing me, but he had already paid the, the penalty. He had already made a sacrifice for me. And also the blessings that comes from God, that comes to him, I can access, you know, as I, as I go on my knees, as I pray, as, as I uh, meditate, I can access those blessings because he is a high priest that lives forever and he will not fail in his ministry. Here we have it today, friends. We have come to the end of another day's lesson. What a fitting lesson for the middle of the week. Jesus, our high priest. And I would end with the words of saying we have a high priest up in heaven. What is that high priest doing? He's there interceding on our behalf. He says he's blotted out all our transgression, all our sins, and making representation for us before the Father in a temple made by God, not man. And so we have to be thankful that in spite of all our frailties, all of our shortcomings, all of our sins, that there is a high priest in heaven interceding on our behalf. And if we put our trust in him, if we accept his sacrifice on the cross and allow him to transform our lives, we can be ably represented by him. God bless you and have a wonderful day.